Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Novak. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, I report on foreign producers supplying baby formula to the U.S. to ease supply shortages. Ana Mateo brings us this week's words and their stories on the phrase, sweeping it under the rug. Faith Perlow reports on Chinese cultural organizations in America that have reopened under new names. Ashley Thompson and John Russell report on a group of artists in Kashmir who are forming a new musical tradition. And Brian Lin has a story about foot and mouth disease in Indonesia affecting the country's Eid festival. But first, the U.S. government is trying to help foreign makers of baby formula stay in the U.S. market for a long period of time. It is part of an effort to diversify the suppliers for manufactured mother's milk or formula. The move comes after federal officials ordered the closure of the largest American factory for baby formula. The closure created a nationwide shortage. Foreign producers have recently sent supplies to the United States under temporary emergency approval to ease the shortage. Recently, the Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, said it will permit foreign producers to supply the U.S. with baby formula for a long time. The agency will provide a way for producers temporarily selling in the U.S. to meet existing regulatory requirements. Officials say the change will provide Americans with more choices and ease supply shortages. Dr. Robert Califf is the head of the FDA, and Susan Maine is the director of the agency's Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. In a statement, they said, the need to diversify and strengthen the U.S. infant formula supply is more important than ever. They noted, the recent shutdown of a major infant formula plant has shown just how vulnerable the supply chain has become. The U.S. has tried to increase supply of baby formula after federal officials in February closed a factory in the state of Michigan over safety concerns. The factory is operated by Abbott. The company is the largest U.S. producer of baby formula. The factory reopened on June 4th after the company promised to take cleaning and safety measures. But it closed again in mid-June after severe weather caused damage to the plant. The company said it needs time to repair the damage, and clean the factory again after heavy storms went through southwestern Michigan on June 13th. In May, the FDA eased federal import regulations to permit baby formula to be shipped to the U.S. The administration of President Joe Biden then approved the use of the Defense Production Act. That law permits the government to direct economic activity to national defense. Use of the law provides federal support to get formula from foreign countries into the U.S. The FDA has approved what is equal to 400 million 237 milliliter bottles for import into the U.S. Companies and their manufacturing facilities must meet rigorous FDA standards that ensure the formula is both safe and nutritious, Calif and Maine said. These standards are necessary to protect our children and will not be sacrificed for long-term supply considerations. 
The term standards describes a level of quality that is required by a government agency. The FDA's policy on foreign producers of baby formula will end in November, but the administration said it will renew the policy if necessary to secure enough supply in the U.S. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. On today's show, we go into the home. We talk about a common object that gives us some useful expressions. That object is a rug. Rugs are floor coverings that serve many purposes in a home. They add color and style to a room. They protect the floor. Rugs can make a home more comfortable and quiet. They can also make a slippery floor safer to walk on. But since they are on the floor, rugs can trap a lot of dirt. When we clean the floor, it is a good idea to remove the rugs first. This way, you can sweep away all the stuff that gets trapped under it. But if you don't have time, or are feeling a little lazy, you can always clean the floor quickly, and just sweep around the rug. The dirt under the rug cannot be seen. It's like it's not there. And that brings us to our first expression: to sweep something under the rug. When we sweep something under the rug. We try to hide something. What kinds of things do we try to hide? Things that are illegal, unethical, embarrassing, or just wrong. For example, the corrupt politician won re-election because he swept all his failures and dirty dealings under the rug. Here is another example. Before meeting her new boyfriend's family, my friend carefully and completely swept all her past mistakes under the rug. She wanted a fresh start. She decided to keep her complex past hidden. You might also hear someone say, "Brush something under the rug." The word "brush" in this case means to clean something off. Now, as we said earlier, one purpose of a rug is to make the floor safer. But there are also ways that a rug can be dangerous. If someone pulls a rug out from under your feet, you most likely would fall, and you could get hurt. So when we pull the rug from under someone's feet, we put that person in a difficult and unexpected situation. We suddenly take away support or help from them. For example, I felt like someone had pulled the rug out from under my feet when I found out my apartment building was being torn down. I had only one week. To find a new place to live, you can also say to pull the rug out from under someone. It means the same thing. We finish today's program not with another expression, but with a joke. As we discussed earlier, a rug covers and protects the floor, but the word cover has many meanings. Cover can also mean to give protection or to pay for something. So let's say I go out to dinner with a friend and she forgets money. I can say I have money. I've got this covered. That means I will pay. Here is another example. Some home insurance policies do not cover flood damage. The policies do not protect against 
high water damage. Knowing the definition of cover helps you understand this joke. Once there was an old floor in an old house. It learned that the owner of the house wanted to put in a new floor. The floor cried and cried about the bad news. Hearing the floor crying, the rug wanted to make the floor feel better. So, what did the rug say to the floor? Don't worry, I've got you covered. A recent report says Chinese cultural organizations in America that closed after being named foreign agencies by the U.S. government have reopened under new names. The National Association of Scholars, a nonprofit organization supporting education, released the report. It said Confucius Institutes, cultural organizations with ties to the Chinese Communist Party, are reopening with different names or reorganizing. Most of the institutes closed after being designated a foreign mission by the U.S. State Department. A foreign mission is an office that carries out diplomatic or similar work for a foreign government. Of 118 Confucius Institutes that once operated in the United States, 104 have closed or are in the process of closing, the report said. Of these, at least 28 have replaced their Confucius Institute with a similar program, and at least 58 have maintained close relationships with their former Confucius Institute partner, the report said. In April 2007, Li Chongchen was a top propaganda official and a member of the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party, CCP. He told the Chinese state-run newspaper, Xinhua, that Confucius Institutes were an important part of the CCP's external propaganda structure. Critics considered the Institutes propaganda machines for the CCP. They also considered them a tool to monitor and interfere with speech and activities at American universities. For example, in 2009, North Carolina State University canceled its plan to invite the Dalai Lama, the Tibetan spiritual leader, to speak after objections by the Confucius Institute. Ten years later, in 2019, the U.S. Department of Defense announced it would not provide financial support for universities that had Confucius Institutes. In August 2020, the U.S. State Department designated the Confucius Institute U.S. Center as a Chinese foreign mission in the United States. The center was considered the headquarters for Confucius Institutes in the U.S. Organizations designated as foreign missions must give reports to the U.S. government about finances, employees, educational material, and activities that happen in the U.S. U.S. schools were cutting ties with the programs even before the State Department's finding. In July 2020, the Chinese government reorganized and renamed the Confucius Institute's parent department. It is now called the Ministry of Education Center for Language Exchange and Cooperation, CLEC. Xin Huanet is a state-controlled newspaper service in China. It said CLEC created a separate organization, the Chinese International Education Foundation, CIEF. CIEF financially supports and oversees Confucius Institutes and many of their replacements. 
On July 1, 2021, one day after its Confucius Institute closed, the College of William and Mary established the WNM BNU Collaborative Partnership with Beijing Normal University, the school said. The Chinese University was the American school's former Confucius Institute partner. It provided the programs the Confucius Institute used to offer. Rochelle Peterson is a senior researcher at the National Association of Scholars and one of the writers of the report. She said nothing changed but the name. Perry Link is a professor of Chinese language studies at the University of California, Riverside. Link said that although the Confucius Institutes cannot censor students, their influence on educators comes in other ways. He said, if you are in the Confucius Institute and create some programs with CCP money, would you host a memorial event for the Tiananmen Square massacre? Of course not. Are there written rules that stop you? No. Did someone above tell you not to? No. It's self-censorship. It's psychological. Jonathan Sullivan is a China specialist and professor of political science at the University of Nottingham in Britain. He took part in studies of the Confucius Institutes in their original form. He told VOA in an email that fears about what they are doing are overblown. He said students need to learn the Chinese language and culture. But governments in many nations have not stepped in to support ways that students can study Chinese language and culture outside of the Confucius Institutes. Sarfaraz Javed lives in Kashmir. The Muslim-majority area is in the Himalaya Mountains. The area has been divided between India and Pakistan since 1947. People living there have faced many years of conflict, military presence, and crackdowns. Javed is among a group of artists in Kashmir who are forming a new musical tradition. They call it conscious music. The music mixes Sufi rock with hip-hop music. Sufism is a form of Muslim belief. Javed moves his body to the sound of the guitar. His voice rings out through the forest. What kind of soot has shrouded the sky? It has turned my world dark. Why has the home become entrusted to strangers? Javed is a poet, like his father and grandfather. His song is called Khwaftan Bange, Kashmiri for the call to night's prayer. I just express myself and scream, but when harmony is added, it becomes a song, said Javed. The new music often includes religion indirectly. The hidden religious ideas are meant to get around measures that restrict speech in Indian-controlled Kashmir. The restrictions have led many poets and singers to limit what they wish to say. The music also seeks to bridge tensions between Muslim tradition and the modern world in an area where many people are conservative. Kashmir has a tradition of spoken poetry that is hundreds of years old. It is heavily influenced by Islam. After a rebellion against Indian rule broke out in 1989, poetic descriptions of freedom were heard from the loudspeakers at Muslim religious centers. Poems based on historical Islamic events were sung at the burials of fallen rebels. Twenty years of fighting left tens of thousands of civilians, rebels, and government forces dead, before the armed struggle eased. Unarmed mass demonstrations took place in 2008 and 2010. Around that time, Kashmir also saw the rise of protest music 
in English language hip hop and rap. It was a new kind of resistance music. Singer songwriter Rushan Elahi performs under the name MC Kash. His angry music has influenced young people fighting India's sovereignty over the area. Kash's songs got dangerously close to sedition. The crime of saying, writing, or doing something that urges people to disobey their government. It is illegal to question India's territorial claims to the area. Police questioning pushed Kash to a point where he almost stopped making music. Tensions rose in the area in 2016 when Indian troops put down another massive public uprising. Leading to a renewed militancy, three years later, in 2019, India cancelled the area's partial self-rule. It also put in place severe restrictions on communications, including the press and other forms of free expression. The crackdown that began in 2019 has continued, but many artists continue playing the music that made them famous. Many of their songs are widely shared on social media. Conscious music has grown further, as artists more recently began including Urdu and Kashmiri song words called lyrics. A group of young artists gathered recently with musician Zishan Nabi in Srinagar, Kashmir's main city. They debated the hidden meanings and religious imagery in their work. Arif Farooq is a hip hop artist who performs under the name of Kafila. Religious symbolism, Kafila said, is a creative device that represents Kashmir's pain and avoids punishment from the government. You want to steal, but you don't want to be caught, Kafila said. On a recent night, the artist behind the song Kaftan Bange. Sat at the edge of Srinagar's Dal Lake, he sang a song for his homeland. The sun dropped behind the mountains, and a light rain began to fall. He ended his song by saying the names of disappeared people. A distant family member was among the names. I reflect what I see, Javed said. I see pain, agony, and loss. An outbreak of foot and mouth disease in Indonesia is threatening to disrupt the country's Eid al-Adha festival. The festival happens during the Muslim holiday of Eid al-Adha. It celebrates the Prophet Abraham and his willingness to sacrifice his son. Muslims often mark the holiday by killing sheep, cattle, or goats. Some of the animal meat is given to the poor. Foot and mouth disease, which sickens animals, is a big threat to agriculture and food producers. This year, the Eid al-Adha holiday falls on July ninth. But animal traders have reported lower sales this year because of the presence of foot and mouth disease. The disease can spread quickly among animals, including cattle, sheep, goats, and pigs. While it can be deadly for animals, foot and mouth is not generally considered a threat. To human health, this year is a year of loss for us," said Jamal Lule, a trader in West Java. He told Reuters news agency he had only sold fifty cows this year. Before COVID, we could sell up to three hundred thirty cows, and during COVID, it was around. One hundred seventy. This year, sales have dropped drastically.
Indonesia launched a nationwide animal vaccination program in an attempt to limit the outbreak, which began in May. More than 317,000 animals have been infected in 21 Indonesian provinces. Government records show that more than 3,400 animals had been killed in an effort to contain disease spread. Mohammed Hussein Albana is a livestock trader in Jakarta. He told Reuters, people's enthusiasm for sacrifice has not been diminished, but they are more worried about the health of the animals. Until the last outbreak, Indonesia had been free of foot and mouth disease since 1986. Iskandar Saputra is a Jakarta buyer who said he is still willing to take the risk. Ultimately, it is the consumer's decision, he said, but he added, I think the cows sold here are safe and healthy. I'm Brian Lynn. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Dan Novak.